What is more important than a happy family life or a fleeting romantic relationship? Why do people commit adultery rather than remain faithful to their spouse? Let's listen to this story and draw conclusions. I don't think I can claim to be the perfect husband. My job tends to put stress on my life, and I admit that sometimes I don't come home in the most cheerful mood. Besides, I may not be the highest paid person, and I'm certainly not a millionaire. But we still live comfortably. We have a beautiful house and the luxury of owning two cars. My wife has a lot of amazing things in her wardrobe, and our eight-year-old daughter Jennifer is gifted with an abundance of expensive toys. Ultimately, I see myself as a humble, single-minded person who deeply values his wife and family and strives to work hard for their happiness. Linda and I have been happily married for almost 12 years now, and for the most part, it has been an idyllic journey. But recently, there has been a shift in our relationship that has left me at a loss. Over the past couple of months, I couldn't help but notice a change in Linda's behavior towards me. She seemed detached and detached, showing an unusual detachment. At times she found fault with my actions or words, which was completely out of character for her. Worried, I tried to start a conversation on this topic. I asked her if she was mad at me for some unknown reason, but, as is often the case with women, she simply brushed off any wrongdoing and said that nothing terrible was happening. She just felt a little tired or had a hard day. At first, I decided to give her some time to figure out the reasons for her anxiety. Unfortunately, over time, her distant behavior began to tire and cause more and more irritation. In addition, as any married couple can confirm, unresolved problems in a relationship tend to spill over into the bedroom, causing additional complications. I have always tried to maintain a sense of spontaneity and excitement in our personal lives. Being a romantic person, I often started the intimacy process by surprising my partner with a bouquet of roses after a long day at work. Previously, these gestures did not cease to ignite passion and intimacy in the following nights. But lately, my expressions of love have been met only with gratitude and a peck on the cheek. Instead of appreciating my affectionate gestures for what they really are, she couldn't help but consider it a weak attempt to compensate for my past mistakes. Linda refrained from intimate life for weeks, and she responded to my attempts to initiate intimacy either with a lack of desire or with a classic excuse in the form of a headache. Even on those rare occasions when she reluctantly succumbed to my persuasions, she lay passively while I took over everything. Gradually I noticed that I was emotionally disconnected from the situation. When I returned home, I focused on spending time with my daughter and deliberately minimized any attention to my wife. Naturally, all these actions only aggravated the situation. Feeling desperate, I used all my free minutes at work to think about everything. I remembered the exact moment and how it all started. Trying to find any actions on my part that could provoke a change in Linda's attitude, I searched my memory, but to no avail. My mind relentlessly replayed numerous scenarios, hoping to discover a cause and effect relationship. When I became aware of another disturbing reason for Linda's behavior, I found myself thinking about an unthinkable possibility. Can my wife be involved in an affair? Although I repeatedly assured myself that she would never betray our relationship, I couldn't help but notice some inexplicable inconsistencies. It seemed that some piece of the puzzle was missing Linda, me and a potential lover. Despite trying to convince himself otherwise, curiosity got the better of him. I delved into the research, studying the signs and clues that should be paid attention to, changes in behavior, clothing, daily routine, and other similar signs. To be honest, I haven't noticed Linda wearing any stylish outfits or looking more attractive. However, my meetings with her are limited to the fact that I return home from work, so who knows how she dresses during the day. Besides, I don't know her daily routine at all. It seems that she is always in a hurry, but for what reason? Again, it remains a mystery. And yet when it came to her behavior, some of the signs seemed eerily familiar. Although I was thinking about hiring a private investigator, I lacked solid evidence. 
having only suspicions and having no good reason to hire a private investigator, I took the matter into my own hands and began to conduct my own investigation. To begin with, I started making random calls home during the day, hoping to catch my spouse off guard. The results were inconclusive, sometimes she was there, and sometimes she wasn't. Deciding to collect more evidence, I went ahead and bought an old surveillance camera. Carefully, imperceptibly, I installed it under the eaves of the garage so that it would remain hidden from prying eyes. Having connected the camera to a tape recorder, cleverly hidden behind cans of paint on the back shelf, I tried to record all suspicious cars approaching the house. But my attempts were interrupted because there is something else in this story. There have been no incidents for two weeks now. Several times I caught a glimpse of my wife leaving the house, and only then I heard her claim that she had been at home all day. But the duration of her absence was too short to conclude that something suspicious had happened, unless her boyfriend had the miraculous ability to do everything in one minute. Perhaps it was just a trivial errand that she considered too insignificant to tell me about. This, of course, did not serve as concrete proof of any violations in our relationship. Over time, despite the absence of any red flags or tangible evidence, my suspicions intensified. As her mood continued to deteriorate and our intimate moments became less frequent, I began to get frustrated. Our twelfth wedding anniversary was approaching, and I saw it as a chance to break out of the monotony. After a long break from dining and dancing with Linda, the idea of going out and having fun popped into my head. Perhaps it could rekindle the flames in our marriage. Of course, I couldn't wait to try it. To ensure uninterrupted bliss, we agreed that Jennifer would spend the night with my parents. I booked a table at Plato's restaurant, which held a special place in Linda's heart. As the maitre d' escorted us to a table, Linda wrapped her arm around my arm, hoping to regain the charm we once shared. But something was wrong, as if there was a subtle tension in the air. In search of solace, we decided to order a bottle of wine, and slowly but surely, I noticed how a habit appeared in Linda's behavior. With every sip, she looked like the bright person I fell in love with. Our conversation flowed easily and naturally, filled with levity and playfulness. As our dinner came to an end, it became obvious that my amazing wife was looking forward to a night of carefree fun. Despite my initial desire to visit the newly opened dance club, Linda managed to convince me to stay at our usual place. It was a pleasant place, decorated with warm and attractive lighting with a charming dance floor. In an institution designed for a more mature audience, there was music that was conducive to dancing, and it was easier for Linda to persuade me to this decision. I must admit that I am quite skilled on the dance floor, and it was this talent that initially attracted Linda and me. Our shared passion for dancing is one of the foundations of our relationship. Finding a cozy, secluded table for two, we ordered drinks and took a sip each. Inspired by the atmosphere, we decided to demonstrate to the rest of the people that dancing is more than just two-step movements, evoking nostalgia for the times when we shared joyful moments together. After almost an hour of enthusiastic dancing, fatigue gradually fell on us, forcing us to retreat to our table to get a well-deserved rest. While I was sinking into a chair, Linda gracefully took a sip of wine, and then, excusing herself, gracefully headed to the ladies' room. I watched what was happening, anticipating sensual delight, imagining the grace with which an attractive couple swayed their hips with each step. But as soon as I managed to take my eyes off my wife's flawless beauty, it became obvious that she was attracting more than just my attention. A strikingly handsome gentleman was sitting at an inconspicuous corner table on the opposite side of the dance floor and was closely following Linda's every move. I briefly wondered if there was some kind of relationship between them, as she seemed to briefly meet his gaze. When she entered the bathroom, I had the feeling that the guy was looking right at me, smirking smugly. But from this distance, it was difficult to confirm. The place we were in was exclusively a dance club, so I was curious why he came unaccompanied, but I decided that maybe, like Linda, his partner was also in the ladies' room. I watched him imperceptibly, 
holding him in my peripheral vision and looking forward to when my amazing wife would appear again. Once again, when she crossed eyes with him on the way back, I was sure that I had witnessed their meeting. In an instant, all my doubts receded. Darling, could you bring me another glass of wine? Linda asked, sitting down in an armchair. I was already feeling awkward, and I didn't like the idea of leaving Linda alone while I stood at the counter and waited for the unhurried bartender to complete my order. After looking around, I managed to attract the attention of one of the waitresses. When the girl came to our table to take the drinks order, I couldn't help but notice a note of disappointment on Linda's face. Instantly, I felt a sense of foreboding, as if the evening was destined to change for the worse. Curiosity got the better of me, and I turned around to look at the lone figure still sitting in the corner. It was obvious that he was alone. Unable to suppress my curiosity any longer, I directed my question to Linda. Who is that guy in the corner? The question caught her off guard, and for a brief moment panic flashed in her eyes. But she quickly regained her composure and replied, Which guy? I could tell by the awkwardness in her voice that I had succeeded. You definitely looked into his eyes when you went to the bathroom, I argued. She innocently replied, Honey, I have no idea what you're talking about. I didn't even look at anyone. But as soon as our drinks arrived, I noticed that Linda's eyes quickly slid behind her back. Turning around, I saw that Mr. Loner was approaching our table. Surprisingly, he didn't even pay attention to my presence. Instead, he walked right up to Linda and asked her, Would you like to dance? As soon as the words left my mouth, my voice got louder. No thanks, I grumbled, my annoyance obvious. My answer seemed to elicit a response from him. With a mocking grin, he replied, I was talking to a lady. I said yes, but the lady is my wife, and I have the right to decide who she can dance with and who she can't. At that moment, Linda intervened. Harry, she interjected, her voice calm but firm. You're being rude. My reaction was quick. Rude? Do you even know this guy? I felt that my question took her by surprise, but I continued. I was referring to this particular person. I do not know how things are between you, but he approached my wife and asked her to dance without acknowledging my presence. Such behavior is not only impolite, but also extremely disrespectful. Before Mr. Loner could say anything, I interrupted him and made it clear that I did not need his participation, since I was having a conversation with my wife. Then I turned to Linda and said that if he had asked me for permission for them to dance together, I might have considered that option. But under the circumstances, I categorically refuse. Harry, she said. With a sharpness in her tone, she said, You're being stupid. There is absolutely no connection between me and this man. And yes, we are married, but you don't own me. I'm not your maid. And if I want to dance with someone, then damn it, I'll do it. I couldn't understand that my wife was talking to me in such a disrespectful manner. She had never shown me such disdain before. My blood boiled with rage, destroying all hopes of a pleasant romantic evening with my wife. Despite this, I tried to restrain my anger. While I was trying to pull myself together, she continued, but in a softer tone. Darling, all I want is a little pleasure. But Linda, today is our anniversary, and I want to have fun too. Unfortunately, watching you dance with someone else is not part of my idea of entertainment, especially after I asked you not to get involved with him. I understand that I don't own you and I can't stop you from dancing with him. But if you do decide to do it, ask him to take you home since I'm already leaving. After spending 12 years in each other's company, I learned how to decipher Linda's emotions. When her eyes met mine, her expression clearly spoke of anger. But I was struck by her inability to perceive the same feelings reflected on my face. Realizing that it was impolite to continue our argument in the presence of this gentleman, I made a decision. Why don't you dance with him for now and we'll discuss this issue later? I suggested, trying to defuse the tense situation. Linda abruptly interrupted me and reached out to take the stranger's hand. With a smug grin adorning his face, she stood up, 
and together they walked gracefully to the dance floor. I don't think they even noticed my departure, because I quickly left the room before the dancing started. It wasn't until I was eight blocks from home that the ringing of my cell phone roused me from my reverie. Linda's voice, full of regret, asked, Where have you been? I replied in a solemn tone, I'm heading home to pack my things. Is there a reason to worry? There was a momentary silence. Then she asked, Get ready? What are you even talking about? Pack a suitcase? Where are you going to go? Not knowing where to go, I replied, I can't say for sure. All I know is that I'm leaving you behind. I've reached the limit of my tolerance for this. Harry, are you serious? It was just a dance and a trifling one at that. Are you seriously thinking about breaking up our 12-year marriage over dancing? The dance itself doesn't matter, Linda. Why would you continue to be married to a man you don't love and respect? To be honest, I didn't catch you red-handed, but I strongly suspect that you are cheating on me. And my intuition points to that jerk you just danced with. The way you exchanged glances on your way to the bathroom was obvious. And when he came to our table, he treated me with the same disregard that a man shows to the husband of a woman with whom he is having an affair. No, Harry, she said in a softer tone. You are very dear to me and I appreciate you very much. I assure you there is nothing between me and this gentleman. I would never betray your trust. Why did such thoughts even occur to you? It's just unbelievable. It's been over two weeks since we last shared an intimate moment, and even then, your involvement was minimal. You've become irritable and short-tempered lately. Please don't claim to respect me because your actions today prove otherwise. You're great at pretending if you're not actually having an affair. The line was silent for a while, until finally there was an answer. Harry, I'm sorry. I really didn't understand the situation. I regret my behavior and the way I behaved tonight. I apologize for giving you reason to suspect me of having an affair. There was a short pause before she spoke again. I admit, I looked at this man when I was heading to the bathroom. He was quite attractive. When we were dancing, I accidentally noticed him, and it seemed to me that we both closed our eyes at the same time. But I want to warn you that I'm not having an affair with him. My love, please change your mind and come back to me so that we can discuss this misunderstanding. No. As I said before, I'm done with this situation. I warned you that if you decide to dance with this man, you'll have to find your own way home. And I meant every word. I'm driving up to our house now and I'll be gone by the time you arrive. If you're really having an affair, it might be better if you go home with your lover and forget about me. Please, my love, believe me when I say that I'm not having an affair. I'm asking you to pay attention to me. I'll call a taxi, but I ask you to stay there until I get home. Now I noticed a sense of urgency in her voice, unlike anything I had heard before. It's very important that we talk about this case. Please rest assured that I will be back home soon. With a plea, she disconnected the call. When I got to our house, I went upstairs and packed my things. Exactly 12 minutes later, I left the house. A thought flashed through her mind. Would she really take a taxi, or would this vile man give her a lift? To clarify the situation, I drove off a block, turned off the headlights and waited patiently for everything to be clarified. About 15 minutes later, a yellow taxi pulled up to the entrance. Getting out of the car, Linda hurried into the house. Satisfied with what I saw, I decided to head to the motel. But almost immediately, my mobile phone rang. Deciding not to be distracted anymore, I turned it off. Although I still had no concrete evidence of infidelity, my suspicions were heightened. It seemed very likely that Linda and the man she was dancing with knew each other. Now was the right time to use the services of a private investigator. Not being at home, Linda may have sought solace in the arms of her lover. The next day, I was flipping through the yellow pages and came across a private investigator whose ad caught my attention. Without hesitation, I went to his office and handed over the prepayment. That done, I plunged into my work. Suddenly, Tracy, my secretary, urged me to call my wife urgently. According to her, Linda had already tried to call me 20 times, 
which undoubtedly indicated that something was wrong. I explained to Tracy that Linda and I were going through hard times, and I decided not to answer her calls. I asked Tracy to firmly convey this idea to Linda the next time she calls. Besides, I called the receptionist in the lobby and asked her not to let Linda into the office if she came. I wanted the detective to have the opportunity to uncover any clue. From that moment on, all that remained was to wait. Later in the day, our neighbor Andrea called me. Anticipating that the conversation would be about Linda, I reluctantly answered the phone, not wanting to seem impolite. Hi, Harry, Andrea began. Linda explained to me what happened last night. She desperately wants to apologize but claims that you refused to talk to her. That's right, I confirmed. I found that I couldn't get along with her. A faint sigh came from the other end of the phone line, hinting at her disappointment. That's when she mentioned your suspicions of her infidelity. Of course, you don't really believe that, do you? In the last couple of months, her behavior has taken an unusual turn, and that evening only confirmed my doubts. She claimed they were just dancing together, but that wasn't entirely accurate. They exchanged glances even before he came to the table, and his behavior towards me was undoubtedly disrespectful. Linda unconditionally sided with him and followed in his footsteps. Despite my warnings about the dire consequences of dealing with such an unpleasant person, she remained indifferent. It is very likely that there is an intimate relationship between them. Harry, please reconsider your position. Having lived next door to both of you for many years, I believe I have sufficient knowledge to determine whether Linda is unfaithful, and I have never seen any evidence to support such a claim. Unfamiliar cars or people have never been seen near your house. I beg you to believe that she understands the unacceptability of dancing with this man. Her anger is caused by your ban, not a sincere desire to challenge you. But after reflecting on your words, she realized that you were really right. Trust me, Harry. I know Linda well, and I can assure you that she is not cheating on you. She really loves you, and deep down you know it. Still, I have to admit, Andrea, I'm starting to doubt it. Her actions that night did not indicate love, that's for sure. Harry, I'm begging you, please talk to her. You can't solve anything if you don't communicate. I admitted that Andrea was right, but I wanted to stall for time until the private investigator finished his work. Andrea, could you do me the courtesy to let me know that I'll be in touch with her in a couple of weeks? I have a few questions to think about. The sound of a sigh reached my ears again. All right, Harry, she said. I'll let her know, but I beg you to contact her after that. Promise me that, please. I promise, I assured her. When we said goodbye, my thoughts started wandering again. Andrea and her husband Don were our cherished friends. It was inconceivable to me that Andrea could deceive me. If Linda was unfaithful, she did it with great care. Over the next two weeks, I became restless. I have contacted the investigator several times. In response, he simply said that he had no news at the moment. Eventually, he called me and asked me to be present in his office. When I took my seat, my stomach fluttered with anxiety. He handed me a heavy paper bag across the table. With trembling hands, he handed me the package. You can ignore all the mundane details, he instructed when I started looking through the first page of the report. Just go to the conclusion on page 5. Anxiously, I flipped through the pages until I found what I was looking for. After conducting a comprehensive investigation, our office found no evidence to support the client's concerns about his spouse's infidelity. To say that I was shocked is an understatement. Not knowing how to react, I felt relief and disbelief. Although the news was undoubtedly positive, I couldn't help but doubt its authenticity. Turning my gaze to the gentleman sitting at the table, I asked, Are you absolutely sure? Mr. Fremont, I have been providing constant surveillance of your wife for the past two weeks. We carefully monitored her activities inside and outside the house, and also carefully monitored her phone conversations. I followed her every time she left the house, 
scrupulously examining her phone records and credit card statements. Despite my relentless searches, there was not the slightest evidence that she had an extramarital affair. The weight of anxiety was lifted from my shoulders, and a wave of relief surged over me, threatening to overwhelm my emotions like a crying baby in his workplace. The detective advised me to return home to my wife and child, admitting that happy endings are very rare in his work. Grateful for the advice, I expressed my gratitude to him and retired to my modest motel room to collect my thoughts. The weekend was spent in deep thought. I carefully scrolled through every detail in my head, trying to figure out the confusing situation. On Monday morning, I got through to Linda. Her voice was trembling and sounded weak when she picked up the phone. Hi, it's me, I greeted her. Are you all right? You're not feeling well. There was a short pause, and then Linda repeated my name, filled with remorse. Harry, Harry, I'm so sorry. I do not know what I will do if you do not come back to us. I tried to be strong for Jennifer, but all I do is cry. I am so sorry. I guess I took you for granted. You were absolutely right. I should have told the man I was with that I was married and stepped aside. I heard her sobbing again, and the sound pierced the air. It dawned on me that I hadn't shown her the respect she deserved, and I couldn't figure out why. To tell the truth, I deeply admired her, and my love for her was immeasurable. Harry, if you give me one more chance, I'll never make that mistake again, not in a million years. Suddenly, Linda made a request that took me by surprise. Her behavior was strikingly different from what I had seen at the dance club. My silence led her to draw the wrong conclusion. You're coming back, aren't you? She asked. Without hesitation, I replied, assuring her, yes, and hastily added, I would like to propose a temporary agreement. My ultimate wish is to make peace with my wife, Linda. But I mean the Linda I originally fell in love with and married, not the one I've been living with for the last two months. To my surprise, she is still present in herself, Harry. She sincerely expressed her willingness to wait for the return of her beloved man. I'm still skeptical, Linda. Despite the fact that I have gone through a turbulent period characterized by negative attitudes, lack of intimacy and disrespect, I am still not convinced. I need to pick up my stuff from the motel after work, but I'll be back home tonight. I informed her of this, and there was a short pause in response before she uttered a word. Harry, I love you, she confessed, her voice full of remorse. I deeply regret the way I treated you, and I don't want to lose you. Despite her earnest pleading, I couldn't deny that I still had some doubts, as my anger hadn't completely dissipated yet. Despite the overwhelming evidence to the contrary, I had an unshakable feeling that Linda was somehow connected to the man from the dance hall. When the day came to an end, I packed up my things and headed home. Jennifer impatiently rushed to meet me, almost grabbing me on the threshold, and anxiously inquired about my whereabouts. I mentioned that I had been away from home for a long time, unaware that she was not paying attention to the difficulties we were facing. Linda, who was also present, hugged me warmly and showered me with affectionate kisses. I reciprocated the passionate kiss, unable to deny my deep love for my wife. This incident happened two years ago, and since then our married life has been exceptional. Linda has once again become the woman I fell in love with, both in the intimate sphere and beyond. A few months ago, she pleasantly surprised me by celebrating her birthday. Previously, we always considered Linda's birthday to be a significant event. But it wasn't until I got home that we started celebrating my own birthday. Last night was our 14th wedding anniversary, and this time Linda took charge of the whole evening. When she came home from work, she pleasantly surprised me by giving me dinner tickets to the theater with my beloved play, The Man from La Mancha. Then, we went on a serene trip to the shore of the lake, strolling along the beach. When the moon rose and a light breeze blew from the lake, the atmosphere became truly enchanting. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for the magnificent anniversary celebration, I whispered, taking her in my arms, and she quietly asked, feeling an undoubted desire to snuggle up to my trousers. 
realizing that it was necessary to take it off, I nodded in agreement. Thirty minutes later, we were inside the walls of our bedroom, passionately tearing off each other's clothes. Surprisingly, Linda did not give up her courage for this evening. Even now, I'm wondering if she betrayed me or not, forever remaining in the dark. But one thing remains certain. I am grateful that I decided to return home. Despite the early onset of spring according to the calendar, only today Linda was able to go outside without a winter coat. This marked an important moment in Chicago's history, as another winter had passed. Outside, Linda inhaled the invigorating scent of morning dew, a reminder of the serene April rain that had been gently pouring all night. A smile graced her face as she remembered how comfortably and securely she lay in bed, wrapped in her husband's arms, and the rain created a soothing melody. As she walked to the car, she saw stunning blue wildflowers blooming on the lawn. The sight instantly filled her with joy and admiration. Despite the harsh winter, these persistent flowers persisted, wanting to start life anew every spring. Linda's heart was bursting with delight as she continued to hum the tune playing on the car radio. Her goal was a cozy cafe where she was going to meet Katie, a cherished friend whom she had not seen for ages. Coincidentally, Katie had a son the same age as our daughter Jennifer. They crossed paths many years ago during a school event, and a bond developed between them that has stood the test of time. They instantly found a common language and have since become close friends. Katie arrived first and took a small table in the corner by the window. They exchanged waves and smiles through the glass as Linda walked towards the entrance. The lively cafe was filled with the delicious aroma of freshly brewed coffee when Linda joined the queue of customers eager to order a cup of Colombian Paradise. Noticing her friend approaching, Katie stood up. Both girls burst out laughing at the same time, hugged warmly, and then sat down in their seats. It's been a while since we've seen each other, Linda remarked, wanting to meet her good friend as soon as possible. In response, Katie's eyes lit up with joy, and her demeanor radiated warmth and cheerfulness. Carried away by the conversation, the friends plunged into nostalgia, enjoying the memories and sincerely laughing at the funny incidents that occurred during school events. Curious, they asked each other about the children, marveling at how fast they were growing up. When their delightful conversation had been going on for an hour, Katie leaned closer carefully lowering her voice to a low tone. With a touch of mystery, she whispered, Can you promise to keep a secret? asked Katie, looking around nervously. Linda mimicked the act of closing her lips with an imaginary key, emphasizing her seriousness. Worried, her friend asked what was the matter. Katie hesitated for a moment but could no longer contain her excitement. I probably shouldn't tell you about this, but I have to tell someone before I explode, she admitted. Her voice dropped to a whisper as she continued. I'm dating someone, sort of. Katie stopped abruptly, lifting her head from her coffee to meet Linda's gaze. Katie's mischievous half-smile hinted at curiosity. What do you mean by sort of? Are you having an affair? Well, we haven't taken any action yet, but I'm thinking about it. I admit that this is inappropriate, but communicating with him awakens my vitality. His name is Cody, and isn't that a great name? I understand that I shouldn't pursue this, but I really have strong feelings for him, and I'm afraid that he might lose interest if I don't enter into a physical relationship. So let me ask you a question, Linda asked. Are you willing to jeopardize your marriage for him? No way! I have no intention of marrying him. Smiling, she confessed, I'm having a little romance right now, you know. Life is a spice. But she was determined that Bruce would never know the truth, as he would be devastated to find out about her intimate relationship with another person. After taking a sip from her cup, she continued, Besides, Cody is also married, so we both have to be extremely careful. For the past two years, Linda had also kept this secret, not wanting to trust anyone, and now she felt forced to open up to her friend, taking a risk. Katie, do you remember how Harry and I had difficulties a few years ago? He actually dumped me for a while. 
Remember? Yes, I understand. But I've always been in the dark about the reasons for this. You never talked about it. And I didn't want to get involved. I've been keeping this secret to myself all this time. And I need you to promise me that you won't tell anyone what I'm going to share with you. She paused, waiting for her friend to give her clear instructions before continuing. It took a moment, but Katie realized what she had been patiently waiting for. Of course, Linda, I swear to you, yes. If this information ever gets out, it could undoubtedly ruin my marital relationship. That's why I refrained from trusting anyone. But Katie, it's imperative that you hear this before you jeopardize your own marriage. As soon as the waitress appeared with a steaming pot of coffee, Linda waited patiently while she filled their cups. It seems like I'm not like countless other married women. After living together for 12 years, I began to feel a sense of monotony. Our daily routine has become tedious and uninteresting. The feeling was unusual. After all this time, I found myself looking around and wondering, what am I doing? Where is my life going? Nowhere it seemed that I was stuck in this stagnant state. I lack a sense of purpose for myself. Just at that moment, Katie intervened. I understand, Linda. Your feelings are close to me. I think most women experience this at some point. It's not that you don't love your husband. I adore Harry with all my heart, but I still have a nagging feeling that this is not enough, that something important is missing. It's like I'm gradually sinking into a state of mild depression. Everything has lost its appeal, including making love, depriving me of any excitement. It wasn't anyone's fault. Harry's vitality was noticeably waning, especially in our intimate moments. I should have been happy, but nothing could assuage my displeasure. Even school activities turned into unbearable experiences. Linda took a sip of coffee and looked at Katie, assessing whether her story had found a response. It was obvious that she was interested in her, and she continued. And then I met Terry. Are you implying that you had an affair? Linda confirmed her understanding with a barely perceptible nod. It was really an emotional connection, she said, glad that it hadn't escalated into a physical one. She let out a sigh of gratitude. Reflecting on the past, she recalled the moment in the small grocery store on Marshall Avenue when she first saw him. This man was undeniably captivating, she confessed to Katie. His striking features, including a gruff charm, sandy blonde hair and radiant blue eyes reminiscent of Robert Redford's, attracted the eye. Not to mention that his tall stature, probably exceeding six feet, was noticeable even in his clothes, hinting at a well-built physique. I knew perfectly well that people were looking at me, but I couldn't look away until he noticed me. Embarrassment gripped me when he returned my gaze with a smile, and our playful flirtation began. The interaction was exciting, almost dangerously tempting, but a sudden realization brought me back to reality. I urgently needed to go shopping. Walking through the grocery department, I decided to buy some tomatoes, but fate decreed otherwise. At the moment of the unexpected collision, I found myself face to face with him. His captivating big blue eyes and amazing smile greeted me as he warmly said a simple hello. Katie, I'm sorry to admit this, but I started to feel a little turned on. It was rather awkward, and I silently hoped that he would not detect any unpleasant odor. I felt my cheeks turn red again. To my surprise, he extended his hand to me and introduced himself. Even though he noticed my wedding rings, he looked unfazed and eager to spend time with me. The idea that someone like him was interested in me was very flattering. We struck up a friendly conversation and exchanged jokes as we walked through the shopping aisles. In the end, we came to the cash register. Katie's friend shared the story with her, and she listened carefully, as it seemed strangely familiar to her. A flashback flashed through her mind of how she got the man's phone number and his invitation to lunch. She almost threw away his business card, dismissing the idea of a passionate affair that would surely end in disaster. What? You didn't do that? Her friend asked, intrigued. Katie grinned to show that she hadn't thrown the card away. Instead, 
she hid it in her purse, realizing the possible consequences. As I was returning home, thoughts of Terry occupied my entire mind. Just as I was putting away the groceries, Harry came in. Overwhelmed with guilt, I impulsively attacked him when he offered to help. Perhaps it was an unconscious defense mechanism that worked. Harry innocently asked if anything had happened. At that moment, I decided to come up with a lie. I claimed that I was just tired after going shopping. In fact, I felt a sense of euphoria. Regretting her action, Linda admitted, Deep down, I knew that contacting Terry was morally questionable. Knowing how vulnerable I was because of the emotions that overwhelmed me, I kept repeating the word no in my mind. But I couldn't resist the urge and eventually found one of the few remaining payphones in the city. I dialed the number written on the card he gave me, and we decided to meet for lunch the next day. Filled with fear and anticipation, Katie waited patiently for her friend to take another sip of coffee before sharing her experience. She confessed, Cat, when I went to the restaurant, my emotions were in complete turmoil. I was horrified and delighted at the same time. Besides feeling extremely excited, I couldn't help but remember the moment of our conversation when Terry leaned over and gently took my hand across the table. It reminded me of the innocent excitement I felt on my first date. I must admit, the desire for intimacy with Terry overwhelmed me, but something inside me, either conscience or fear, did not allow me to act. But Terry did not lose his head and started seduction tactics. He started talking about how Harry doesn't recognize or appreciate the incredible woman that I am. I can't believe how stupid I was. I totally fell for it. Gradually, I began to feel bitterness towards my own husband. It didn't take Terry long to convince me that Harry didn't appreciate me enough. Oh my God, Linda, it's like I'm experiencing the same thing, Katie exclaimed. That's why I'm sharing all this with you, Katie. I want you to realize what you can get into. Has the guy you're dating mentioned Bruce yet? No, not at all. Katie paused, considering her answer. Well, not really. He asked, Does your husband realize the size of his fortune? Or something like that. Yeah, and naturally you start thinking about it, don't you? Well, Katie, everything is unfolding right under your nose and you don't even know it. When Harry left my life, he claimed that I had been unhappy with him for two months. I was completely unaware of my actions. This pattern of behavior extended to our intimate moments. I just couldn't muster the enthusiasm for a close relationship with a man who, in my opinion, underestimated me. As she talked, she noticed a sudden understanding dawning in her friend's eyes. Think about this, Katie, she paused, prompting her to think deeply. What kind of man has an affair with a married woman? Can you even imagine Bruce being that kind of person? Katie immediately responded with a strong denial, being sure of Bruce in particular. That's right, Linda exclaimed, emphasizing her point of view. So why put your marriage in danger for the sake of a man capable of such actions? While Katie was thinking about Linda's words, her thoughts were interrupted by Linda, who smoothly continued her story. Next week we met again for lunch. It was getting harder and harder to stay loyal to Harry. With each meal, his persuasive attempts to lure me back to the apartment grew stronger. I noticed a note of disappointment in his behavior as my excuses piled up, realizing that another lunch date would inevitably lead us to intimacy. As we were leaving the restaurant after our third lunch rendezvous, I casually talked about the need to buy a new dress for the upcoming anniversary celebration. I mentioned casually that Harry had suggested the idea of visiting a dance club that we had frequented in the past. Terry, upon hearing this, saw a chance and immediately offered to become my dance partner. I warned him against it, considering it was our anniversary and my husband might not approve if I danced with someone else. Terry, however, arrogantly insisted that it would be a lesson to Harry. According to him, it will show Harry that other men want me and maybe make him appreciate me more. How could you believe that, Linda? Terry really came, didn't he? 
Linda took a sip of her coffee without taking her eyes off her. She noticed him as soon as they entered the room. However, she did not dare to say a word to him. Up to this point, Linda and Harry had been having a lot of fun. But then Terry came up to her and asked her to dance, which made Katie exclaim in shock. Besides, Terry didn't pay any attention to Harry at all, being extremely rude to him. Of course, Harry leaned against the wall, offering Linda an ultimatum. Harry told me that I couldn't dance with him, knowing full well about my occasional stupidity. Despite the fact that I was angry, I defiantly declared that I would still dance with him. Harry warned me that he wouldn't be there when we got back from the dance floor. But people tend to make empty statements. So who believes them? Katie noticed that Linda's eyes filled with tears as she told her story. When we started dancing, I told Terry about his inappropriate behavior towards Harry. I asked him why he was so rude, to which he replied that he wanted to prove his superiority over Harry. I felt a surge of anger. On the dance floor, Terry held me tightly next to him and it bothered me. But what worried me even more was the thought of Harry watching us and getting even more furious. I was so engrossed in this worry that I didn't notice how the first dance ended and the second began. When the dance finally ended, I firmly ordered Terry not to ask me to dance anymore. I made it clear that I intended to spend the rest of the evening with my husband. Returning to our table, I noticed that Terry was walking behind me. Confused and annoyed, I met his gaze, demanding to know what he was doing. He expressed a desire to apologize to Harry. But when we returned to the table, Harry was nowhere to be found. Terry sat down in Harry's empty chair and assured me that he would wait until Harry returned. Personally, I doubted his intention to sincerely apologize. It's more likely that Terry wanted to continue teasing and provoking Harry. After reflecting on the situation, I came to the conclusion that Terry believed that by sowing discord between Harry and me, he would be able to compensate for his inability to start a romantic relationship with me. I'm sure he expected me to seek solace in him, hoping that I would resort to him to vent my emotions. He seemed to believe that he could comfort me for the rest of the night. When I realized Harry was in the men's room, I told Terry to go back to his table, but he hesitated. When the waitress came over, Terry started ordering our drinks. At that moment she asked if we would like to open another account. Confused, I asked if I needed a new account. She replied that Harry had already paid the previous bill before he left. Katie, I can't express the torrent of emotions that overwhelmed me, as if my whole life flashed before my eyes. My married life in particular was completely ruined when he unexpectedly left me. The grief on Linda's face intensified as she told her own heartbreaking story, mirroring Katie's experiences. As she empathized with her friend's suffering, her own emotions gradually came to the surface. A single tear trickled down Katie's face, flowing out of her eye. Worried, Linda reassured her, suggesting that she not go into painful details. But Katie insisted on talking about everything, emphasizing its importance. So let's see, where was I? That's right. I immediately grabbed my mobile and wanted to dial Harry's number, but Terry immediately hugged me tightly and kissed me passionately. I felt dizzy from such sensations. I felt a strong desire. After that, we headed to Terry's car and engaged in passionate intimacy. Katie, I wasn't myself. After that, I called Harry, begging him to come back and pick me up. I begged him to come back and pick me up, urgently needing his presence. It was during this conversation that he revealed his suspicions that I was having an affair, particularly with Terry. Harry admitted that he is thinking about leaving and is not sure if he will ever come back. At that moment, Linda reached for a napkin, expressing her shock and disbelief. My God, Katie, she exclaimed, wiping away tears. This revelation hit me like a hard blow. It was as if a switch had suddenly flipped, illuminating everything with crystal clarity. Harry did not ignore my efforts. Moreover, he did his best to lend a helping hand. It wasn't his fault. It was mine. I took him, Jennifer, and the life we created together for granted. 
It suddenly dawned on me that I was putting my entire marriage in danger for the sake of some despicable person. I begged Harry to come get me again, hoping for an opportunity to discuss everything. Unfortunately, he did not agree and I resorted to calling a taxi. Katie asked where Terry was during all this. He was pleased that he had achieved his goal. Grinning that I was hard to get, but now he's not interested in me. Ignoring him, I slapped him in the face and continued to wait for a taxi. When Katie held out her hand, Linda found comfort in her touch and allowed her to gently wipe away her tears. But when I returned home, I was overcome by a feeling of emptiness. Harry was nowhere to be found. Alarmed, I tried to contact him on my cell phone, but found that it was turned off. Katie, I can't express the depth of my concern at that moment. It seemed to me that my marriage was collapsing right before my eyes, destroying everything that my family and I had worked so hard to build. The fear that gripped me was unlike anything I had ever experienced. The next day, I tried to contact him at his workplace, but he refused to talk to me. His secretary informed me that he had given her clear instructions not to allow me to meet with him if I came. Despite my despair, I turned to Andrea, my neighbor, with a request for a conversation. Considering that Harry really likes her and her husband, I thought she might be able to change his mind. To my surprise, she managed to talk to him, but he just said that he needed time to think about the situation and promised to contact me in a couple of weeks. Realizing that pressure on him would only lead to unfavorable results, I decided to give him the necessary freedom of action. These two weeks turned out to be the most painful period of my life. In Jennifer's presence, I tried to appear strong and just informed her that dad was not at home. But as soon as she wasn't around, I started crying. I thought I had caused significant damage to our relationship. Harry's anger was very strong and I doubted that he would ever come back to me, especially if he suspected infidelity. I'm sorry, Katie, she said sincerely, but it's still incredibly difficult for me to discuss this issue. Taking a deep breath, she boldly continued her story from where she left off. As I said, Harry eventually contacted me and informed me that he was coming home. Katie, I can't tell you how close I was to losing everything at that moment. It really made me realize the value of what I have and realize how lucky I am. After all, Katie, love must transcend mere desire. I love Harry deeply, and he loves me back. In my opinion, no man is worth endangering such love. Wow, Katie replied, her voice filled with thought. You're absolutely right. I can't even imagine what I would do if my husband left me. Have you ever been dishonest with Harry before? Are you kidding? After I almost lost him once, I couldn't accept the thought that it might happen again. Katie, I'm constantly afraid that one day he'll find out the truth. But since he came back, I've been trying to be the best wife. I don't forget about him or our marriage anymore. Every day I express gratitude for what I have and show Harry how much I appreciate him with all the strength of my heart. That's all I can wish for. Katie gently squeezed Linda's hand, offering her support. I appreciate you sharing your story with me, she said warmly. You saved me from making a serious mistake, Linda. Thank you. The friends talked a little more, having previously agreed on a future meeting, and then said goodbye. Linda was relieved to realize that she might have saved her friend from a disastrous choice. When she drove up to her car, she kissed her daughter lovingly, and she thanked her mother for the timely meeting after school. Jennifer is rapidly maturing and approaching her 10th birthday with terrifying speed. It's amazing how quickly time passes. Upon Harry's arrival from work, Linda warmly hugged her husband, showering him with affectionate hugs and kisses. Until that day, she had never touched on the topic of a difficult period in their marriage. The conversation with Katie served as a vivid reminder of the extraordinary life she and Harry had built together. At night, when Harry was peacefully dozing next to her, Linda shifted to her side and propping herself up on her elbow plunged into her thoughts. Looking at the wrinkles that appeared on his face over time, she recalled the moments when each of them debuted. With a flick of her fingertips, 
She traced the outlines of some of the new ones. Her heart was pounding with adoration and affection for the man of flesh and bones lying next to her. Linda silently bent down and gently pressed her lips to his. But when their mouths met, Harry's lips curled into a wide grin. Wrapping his arms around his stunning wife, he wrapped her in his arms and pulled her to him for a passionate and intense kiss. I thought you were asleep, she whispered. Linda leaned over to him and whispered softly, You know what? I was lying here thinking about what to give Jennifer for her birthday, she said. Harry replied curiously, Really? What do you think she really wants? Linda replied, A little brother or sister? The revelation was not entirely unexpected. They had discussed the idea of expanding the family before, but they never came to a consensus. A warm smile spread across Linda's face. It seemed that her husband had just solved this issue. Well, her birthday is just around the corner, dear. Can we start planning? She suggested. Harry's grin widened. You're reading my mind, he exclaimed. Linda was happy in the hope of replenishing their family, but not for long. The next evening, Harry never returned home after work. He sent Linda the entire conversation between her and her friend Katie. Shocked, Linda immediately called her friend and began insulting her, thinking that Katie had recorded a confession of Linda's infidelity and sent it to Harry, but Katie swore that she did not do it. Linda tried to call her husband, but Harry did not answer her call, and Lish wrote that he had been listening to her for two years with the help of a small dictaphone hidden in her purse. Linda and Harry's divorce was full of tears and suffering, and now, three years after Harry divorced her and took custody of their daughter, Linda suffers from severe depression. She has lost a lot of weight and is being monitored in a psychiatric clinic because of her aggression. Once, when she took her daughter away for the weekend, in a fit of anger, Linda threw a glass wine glass at her daughter, after which Linda was forbidden to communicate and see her daughter. Harry is now happily married to another woman who treats his daughter with the same love as her own. And Lita, because of her stupidity, lost not only a loving husband, but also a daughter who is afraid to communicate with her mother. He avoided looking me in the eye, knowing full well how much pain he had just caused me. It was impossible not to understand the extent of my resentment, given our long-standing friendship since the third grade and his role as best man at my wedding. Brandon knew me better than anyone else. Trying to assuage his guilt, I reassured him, Relax, buddy, we're not beheading messengers anymore. Doubt crept into my mind when I asked the question, are you absolutely sure she didn't spot you? Although I couldn't state my confidence with certainty, as soon as I entered the room, I noticed her presence and instinctively turned to approach her. When I saw her in a passionate embrace with another man, I hurriedly looked away and tried to retire to a secluded corner. Although I wasn't sure if she noticed my presence, she didn't show herself in any way. Recently, my closest friend told me the sad news about my wife's infidelity. He got in touch during my office hours and asked for an evening date for a drink. As soon as I looked at his face, an unmistakable feeling of anxiety gripped me. Knowing Brandon's habits, I knew it would be fruitless to pester him with questions about his restless state. He was exhausted and speechless, and I had no choice but to patiently wait for the revelations. After spending about five minutes chatting and casually sipping beer, he eventually got to the point. Rob, I'm really sorry to bring bad news, but I have to tell you that Barb is unfaithful to you, he confessed, apologetically. My initial instinct was to protest vehemently, to declare that he was deeply mistaken. But deep down, I knew he was telling the truth. Having known Barb as long as I had, it was extremely unlikely that he could mistake someone else for her. Curiosity got the better of me, and I asked how he came to such knowledge, prompting him to share intricate details. As a favor to his sister, he reluctantly went on a blind date, and surprisingly, fate gave him an unexpected meeting. In the course of the date, the evening took a disastrous turn. After dropping the girl off at her apartment, he felt an urgent need to drink something stronger. Being in an unfamiliar area, he decided to find the nearest bar. 
Upon entering the establishment, he saw Barb leaving the dance floor, accompanied by a mysterious man. They headed to the booth adjacent to the wall, and before he sat down, an unexpected sight unfolded in front of him. Barbie was passionately kissing a stranger. Shocked, he settled into a chair, forced to watch what was happening. Over the next hour, he watched as Barb and the man enjoyed drinks, danced and exchanged intimate kisses in the booth. Their bodies intertwined, swaying to the beat of the music, and the man's hands explored her freely. When they eventually decided to leave, he took a moment to get up from his seat and discreetly follow them as they left the bar. From afar, he saw them get into the back seat of the car, where Barb's head disappeared from view, and the man leaned back, resting his head on the seat. Despite his curiosity, Brandon refrained from trying to approach the car to take a closer look at it, but he had a strong suspicion that Barb was engaged in intimate activities with this man. After a while, her head appeared and they switched positions. Then Barb disappeared from sight again, and soon after, her feet rose into the air. Feeling anxious, he left the parking lot and returned home. Over the next two weeks, he mentally retold the events, not daring to reveal the truth until he stopped holding it back. On the way home, I was thinking about the night Brandon revealed this information, and I remembered that I was busy in Baltimore solving a production issue. At noon, I called Barb, hoping to talk to her. To my surprise, she mentioned that she was planning to go out for a drink with friends after finishing work. She assured me that there was no need to worry if I called and she didn't answer. It made me wonder if she was doing this regularly, just like Brandon was watching me when I was leaving town. If that's the case, then she should have done it at least twice a month. This puzzled me, because there was no sign of discontent or lack of affection in Barb's behavior towards me. Having been married for 10 years, I thought we had a strong and happy marriage, but it seems I was wrong. I was sure of one thing. I would find a solution. First, I needed to figure out the situation on my own. I couldn't tell Barb what Brandon had witnessed, because that would only lead to an argument filled with phrases like, I'm your wife, who will you trust him or me? To be honest, I would have believed Brandon. Unlike Barb, he had no motivation to cheat on me, and if Brandon had lied, I would have easily verified the truth. I've decided to give Barb more freedom so she can reveal her true intentions, and if she can't do that, I'll keep a close eye on Brandon. I had originally planned to visit our factory in Anniston for an inspection trip, but postponed it to allow Gary to take charge. I arranged with my boss for a week's vacation, making sure that he was fully informed about the situation and was able to handle any calls from Barba to the office. In addition, I enlisted Gary's help, knowing that he would support me because he had recently gone through a difficult divorce after learning about his wife's infidelity. I briefly told him about the situation and he was happy to offer his help. I bought a disposable phone at a nearby store and gave its number only to Gary. On Monday morning I said goodbye to Barb, assuring her that I would contact her as soon as I checked into the hotel. Promising to meet in four days, I went to the airport. After parking the car in a designated parking lot, I went to the Alamo rental office and took a medium-sized sedan. I finally found a suitable motel room for three nights. Gary called me at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and informed me that he had booked room 416 in my name at the Marriott Hotel in the city center. In the late afternoon, I parked my car near Barb's place of work and discreetly followed her as she finished her business. To my surprise, she immediately returned home. After giving her some time, I dialed her number on my personal mobile phone and told her where my apartment was. I warned her not to hang up the phone if a strange man answered it, and explained that there had been a misunderstanding with the booking. It looks like there was a convention in town, and there weren't many rooms available so Gary Williams and I moved into the same room. I'll let you know tomorrow. I'm sending my regards. Bye. I waited until 10.15, but since she hadn't left the house by then, I decided to go to my motel. The next day at noon, I called her to remind her that today was garbage collection day, and so she wouldn't forget to put the trash cans on the curb. 
I'm having dinner with the CEO and the production managers tonight, so if I call late, I probably won't wake you up. If you don't get through by 9, please don't wait. I love you too. Goodbye. That evening, I decided to follow her again, and to my surprise, she immediately went home and did not come out again. This made me wonder if I had jumped to conclusions by suspecting her of infidelity during my trips out of town. I had one more night left before I had to return home as planned. She returned to our house and chose to stay at home for the whole evening, which I observed. The next day, during lunch, I refrained from communicating with her. But at about 5.30 p.m., Gary contacted me and informed me that Barb had left a message for me at the front desk. Curious about her intentions, I used a disposable phone to call her. She just wanted to let me know that she would spend the night with the girls after work and would be home late. So that I wouldn't worry if I called and didn't get an answer, she wanted to warn me in advance. She added a thoughtful note of caution, saying that if she drank too much alcohol, she would take a taxi home. I'll be back home tomorrow, and we can arrange to pick up your car. Your concern for my well-being is one of the many reasons why I adore you, baby. I really love you. I love you, too. I'm looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. Take care of yourself. As soon as she came home from work, I followed her unnoticed. She headed across town and eventually stopped at the very bar where Brandon had noticed her earlier. I never knew the location of this bar and was afraid that Barb would discover my actions. In order to follow her unnoticed, I strategically moved my car. Knowing some of the girls Barb talked to, I kept a vigilant eye on the entrance, but none of them showed up. When night fell, Barb left the building, got into her car and started the engine. Anticipating that I would be trailing her, I prepared myself, but I saw her steer the car to the back of the parking lot expertly parking it in the shady corner. After turning off the headlights, she just lingered there. It took about five minutes before a duo of men came out of the same building. I went to the car and stayed for a few minutes to engage in conversation. Eventually, one of the men got into his car and drove away. The second man remained watching until the car was out of sight. He then headed to the far corner of the parking lot where Barb's car was parked. They both got into the car and gradually got closer, indulging in passionate kisses. After about five minutes of hugging, they both got out of the car. I expected them to go back to the bar, but instead they sat in the back seat of Barb's car. I admit it may seem silly, but up to this point I had been convincing myself that Brandon's claims were completely wrong. Deep down, I believed that Barb truly loved me and would never betray our relationship. I stubbornly adhered to the belief that there must be a logical explanation for all this. But as soon as I saw that she had deliberately climbed into the back seat, my denial instantly disappeared from both my head and my heart. They resumed their passionate kisses, and Barb began to slowly descend until she disappeared from my field of vision. All this time, I've been watching the man look at her, I had an inexplicable desire to see Barb's actions firsthand. Just knowing that Barb was having sex with this man wasn't enough for me. I craved visual confirmation. Getting out of the car, I carefully walked towards Barb's car, trying not to let the man notice my approach. As I approached, Barb's moans became audible. I straightened up to get a better view of the situation inside the car. To my surprise, Barb was stripped from the waist down and expressed a sense of urgency. Hurry up, my love! At that moment, I couldn't contain my delight and began to applaud violently, shouting bravo, bravo, in recognition of the outstanding performance of the first act. Barb looked up when she saw me, and her complexion paled instantly. I've heard before that faces turn pale, but this is the first time I've seen it with my own eyes. You put on an incredible show, I exclaimed, unable to stay in the second room because of urgent personal matters that required my attention. While Barb was trying to free herself from the man's grip, I turned around and headed back to the rental car. As I was preparing to leave my parking spot, Barb got out of the car and hurriedly approached me. She signaled me to stop, and I gradually slowed down. I pulled out of the parking lot and headed back to the motel. 
The next morning, I went to the airport, returned the rented car, and picked up my car from the long-term parking lot. Before continuing my day, I went into the office where Marsha, our secretary, informed me that Barb had made several phone calls and stressed that after receiving the messages, it was urgently necessary to contact her at her workplace. After expressing my gratitude, I went to my office, where I immediately contacted the company's lawyer to get recommendations from him on finding a reliable divorce lawyer. After receiving the recommendation, I did not waste time and immediately dialed the specified number. Fortunately, the lawyer was ready to meet with me on the same day, and I quickly made an appointment. With a determined attitude, I diligently took all necessary measures to protect my interests. First, I took the initiative and canceled all joint credit cards, ensuring a clear separation of our financial obligations. In addition, I asked the local newspapers to publish an advertisement officially acknowledging my innocence of any debts accumulated by Barbara Ann Mercer, formerly known as Barnum. In addition, I have made sure that the legal department is properly notified of this important change. In general, thanks to my active actions, I have provided all possible options, ensuring myself a secure position in this difficult time. I visited the bank and decided to withdraw half of my checks and savings, deleting my name from all accounts and leaving them only in the name of Barb. Unfortunately, later that day I received sad news. Given the financial strain in our marriage, we decided to split everything equally. I did not object and suggested that he go to court if he so wished. He mentioned filing a lawsuit the next day, and I asked how to get a restraining order to keep Barb out of our shared house. He explained that getting a restraining order may not be easy unless there are good reasons. To increase my chances, I decided to fabricate a story. I informed him that Barb and her lover had threatened me with violence when I caught them together, and I was afraid that they would try to harm me in order to get life insurance. He responded positively, saying that such a threat could speed up the case, but he warned that I would need to provide evidence during the hearing, otherwise the restraining order could be lifted. I assured him that this would not be a problem, as I plan to move out of the house soon, and as soon as I do, I will revoke the court order, which will save me the need to hold a hearing. I asked about the timing of this process. I am ready to be present at the courthouse from the moment it opens. In addition, if you are willing to spend $200 to speed up the procedure, we can ensure that she receives the necessary papers by 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Okay, let's get started. I ordered him to contact me as soon as Barb was notified and then returned to the office. Masha has already left, but she left seven messages on my desk, all from Barb. In each message, I was urged to call her as soon as possible. Crumpling them into a tight ball, I quickly threw the papers into the trash. Sinking into a chair at my desk, I began to diligently look through the ads, deciding to find an apartment closer to my place of work. The next morning was devoted to watching the various ads that I had already reviewed. At exactly 1.30, I decided to sign a lease agreement for one of the apartments. At 3.10 a.m., an unexpected call rang, informing me that Barb had been properly informed of the situation. I quickly arranged to rent a truck and bought a sufficient supply of packing boxes. Without delay, I set off on my way home. At 4 o'clock, a courier arrived to deliver the notification to Barb. By handing me a copy of the restraining order, the courier ended this eventful day. According to the order, Barbu was forbidden to approach me within a 500-foot radius. With the help of a few friends, I managed to collect all my belongings from home and load them into a truck. While I was doing this, Barb suddenly appeared in the driveway. After getting out of the car, she began to approach me. In a firm voice, I urged her to get back in the car and leave the house, warning her that I would contact the authorities for violating the restraining order. This is ridiculous, Rob. We need to talk, she insisted. I answered firmly, no, we're not going to talk. I think it's important to emphasize the importance of actions rather than words, especially given my observations of your behavior. Therefore, I urge you to leave. But before you leave, we definitely need to talk. Okay, Barb, I'm giving you a chance to chat. 
but after carefully assessing the situation, I found it necessary to take precautions. I took out my mobile phone, quickly dialed the preset police number, and began to guard the house, locking the door. While Barb was tirelessly banging on the door demanding to enter, a police car accidentally drove up to the entrance. Taking advantage of the opportunity, I went outside and handed the officers a copy of the court order. After reviewing its contents, they quickly informed Barb that by law, she must be at least 500 feet away from home. In a strong voice, she protested, emphasizing that the house belongs to her and declaring her equal right to be present in it. Despite her defiance, the officer warned her to leave or be taken to the police station. A glimmer of hope arose in me. I silently wished that she would continue to argue, as a result of which she would be removed. But to my surprise, Barb suddenly showed some ingenuity. She quickly got into the car and drove off to the end of the block. Grateful for the timely arrival of the officer, I expressed my appreciation before starting to load the truck and leave the territory. Before I left, I made sure that Barb didn't follow me, ensuring her safety and peace of mind. When I arrived at the new apartment, I started the process of settling in. Over the weekend, I focused on getting comfortable before returning to work on Monday. But my quiet start to the week was abruptly interrupted when Marsha appeared at the door of my office and informed me that Barb was waiting on the other end of the line. Having barely realized that I had unfairly burdened Marsh with all the calls and postponed the conversation with Barb, I reluctantly decided to answer the call. Yes, I replied, trying to keep my tone neutral. But Barb begged, Robbie, please talk to me. Feeling no particular desire to engage in conversation, I replied curtly, I have nothing to tell you, Barb. I need to talk to you, but we can't do it over the phone. Rob, I get interrupted at the office all the time. Could you come home? We can have dinner and talk. Thank you, but I don't have a home anymore, and I don't see any reason to come back to you. Okay. Offer me a place and I'll meet you there. But I have to stress that I don't really want to talk, as it would be a pointless use of my time. But if you finished work, you can come to my office. Everyone should be gone by then. I'll only give you 15 minutes, no more. At 5.50, she suddenly appeared. As soon as she crossed the threshold of my office, I motioned her to a chair and said, So Barb, what do you want? That's exactly what I don't want, Rob. I don't want a divorce. I've never wanted to have a wife who meets strangers in bars and sleeps with them in parking lots, but nevertheless I'm here. I'm sorry that you witnessed this, Rob, but even so, it shouldn't be the only reason we broke up. You can't take this seriously. Are you seriously attracted to other men and do you think I won't mind? It's not a few men, Rob. It's just one. I was in a relationship with Jeff even before I met you. We accidentally crossed paths during a night walk with my colleagues and have been dating for about three months now. What? Is that okay with you because you knew him before we met? Rob, I've been dating him for three months now. Have you noticed any changes in my attitude towards you during this time? Have I become less loving than I have been throughout our marriage? I love you, Rob, and I don't love Jeff. Rob, I want to make it clear that my meeting with Jeff has no financial implications for you. I only spend time with him when you're not around. After talking to him, I never come to you. If so, it shouldn't be a problem. I want you to understand that my relationship with Jeff has not caused any harm to our relationship. I'm not disrespecting you by approaching you right after talking to Jeff. I don't meet him secretly behind your back while you're at home. The most important thing, Rob, is that you are my partner. I love you, darling, and I want to grow old only with you. I'm sorry, Barb, but our views are very different. Although you claim that you do not treat me with disdain, I firmly believe that your actions in entering into a relationship with another man are an extreme degree of disrespect for me. It is difficult for me to reconcile your declarations of love for me, your desire to have a future together, and consider me your partner with the fact that you have a close relationship with another person. It is difficult for me to understand this contradiction. If I really held the position of your loved one, 
you would not be associated with Jeff in any capacity. Moreover, it is difficult for me to accept your explanation that your involvement in a relationship with Jeff is simply due to the fact that you had a history with him before our relationship. If that were true, I would have to accept that you might have had intimate relationships with several other men before we met. I only slept with Jeff because he's an exceptional lover. I believe that this clarification sheds light on the situation and somehow justifies it. It was never my intention to hurt you, my love. But if I want to save our marriage, I have to be honest with you, even if it might hurt even more. I talk to Jeff because he fulfills a certain aspect that you lack. I want to make it clear, you are an incredible person and an exceptional husband in almost every way. But when it comes to our intimate moments, I find them unsatisfactory. Our meetings on Tuesdays and Saturdays have become monotonous, predictable and devoid of passion. After one routine meeting you quickly turn away and fall asleep. I crave something more intense. During a casual walk with friends, I unexpectedly met Jeff. I remembered the moments when we had sex together, and how he satisfied me several times a night, sometimes even more than four or five times. I wondered if he still had that ability. Eventually, when he started showing interest in me, I agreed to meet him at the motel. Our meetings were based solely on physical pleasure, devoid of love or affection, just a frank, intense, intimate experience. He gave you what you lacked, Rob. But it was all about the physical aspect, Rob. It didn't cloud my love for you in the least. If I had to choose between a relationship with you, but without intimate satisfaction, or Jeff and an incredible intimate life, I would end up choosing you, Rob. I'm glad to hear that. Let me ask you something. Whenever I came home from work, and you weren't in the mood to cook, and you offered to go out to eat, did I take the initiative and invite you? Of course I did. When you came up to me and said that you had a difficult week and you would like to go somewhere to have fun to relieve stress, did I invite you? Yes, Rob, undoubtedly. And didn't I fulfill your requests? Almost always. Then for God's sake, why didn't you tell me that our intimate life is not satisfying? You've never made any claims, so how should I have known about it? My sex drive is not particularly strong, and I was pleased with our closeness on Tuesday and Saturday, and you were pleased too. If I served you hot dogs every night for a week and you got tired of them, would you tell me about it? You have the freedom to have a relationship with whoever you want, but I can't discuss important things like your sex life with me. In that case, I guess I'll look for communication elsewhere. It's comforting that if you have a choice, you'll still prefer me to Jeff. But Barb, I've made a decision, and you don't have the right to vote. Considering the possibility of staying with an unfaithful partner or ending our marriage, I chose divorce. I gave you the opportunity to speak out, but now our relationship is over. I kindly ask you to refrain from further contact with me, as any communication may take place through my lawyer. Please go away. Rob, please think again. I really love you, my baby. Barb, please leave. Although tears were streaming down her face, she got up and left without saying another word. It's been a week since our divorce was finalized, and I haven't talked to Barb in the last six months. I really miss her. My love for her is still strong, and I believe that it will always be so. Reflecting on what happened, I can't help but wonder if things could have turned out differently if I had just started the car and driven away when I saw her getting into the back seat of her car with Jeff. Perhaps if I had told her about this incident when she returned home, we could have saved our relationship. Unfortunately, I decided to stay, and watching her actions in the back seat left me no choice but to part ways. May 17th didn't really matter. It wasn't some kind of significant event like my wife's birthday, our anniversary, or the day we first crossed paths. It was just an unremarkable day, an ordinary Tuesday, and that's why I chose it. I'm a whale, and after a dozen years of marriage to Lisa, our relationship was losing its spark, becoming somehow callous and predictable. Don't get me wrong, I still cherished her, and our children were my world. Lately I've noticed that her eyes lack that same mesmerizing sparkle when it comes to intimacy. Being an incurable romantic, 
I decided to arrange an unforgettable night for her. On Monday morning while at work, I called Katie, Cheryl, and Karen, three exceptionally attractive single women from the office. Girls, imagine that you have the ability to write the script for the most charming evening of your life, I asked. When the clock struck midnight, they all enthusiastically began to share their dreams of a trip to the captivating city of Paris. I advised the girls not to complicate the romance by offering to spend a cozy evening at home or stay in one of the hotels in the city center. By noon, they were back with a selection of ideas that fit perfectly into my financial constraints. After expressing my gratitude, I treated them to a delicious lunch, after which we eagerly began to work out our plans. Their enthusiasm matched mine, as evidenced by their joyous leaps of delight. I was warned that I shouldn't fail because there was a bet on how my evening would turn out. Having decided to prove that they were wrong, I decided to take a day off on Wednesday so that I could do everything before my wife Lisa returned home. I usually got home around 6, but Lisa was punctual and always came by 3.30 to greet our children when they got off the school bus. To convince her, on Tuesday evening I told Lisa that my parents planned to go with the children to dinner and a show on Wednesday implying that they would not return until 8 o'clock in the evening. The children were even more delighted when I told them that I had a surprise for their mother. It has been confirmed that the children will spend the night with their grandparents, a great opportunity for my parents to pamper them, as they always do. On Wednesday, around 11.30 a.m., I left work holding my checklist tightly in my hands. Since there was free time ahead and the children were safe with their mother, I decided to go to the store. I carefully chose a sweet postcard, a bunch of delicious chocolates, and her favorite wine. The girls gave me a detailed list of tasks, including setting the right lighting and mood music. When I approached the florist, I noticed a puzzled expression on her face as I made an unusual request to her for two pounds of rose petals. But as soon as I told her about my intentions, her confusion quickly dissipated. You must really adore your wife to do such a thing, she remarked, acknowledging that there was love behind my gesture. Leaving the crimson rose petals in my hands, I went to book a table for eight people at Lisa's cherished steakhouse. Anticipating our evening plans, I reasoned that I would need to refresh myself by eight o'clock. In case we decide to cancel dinner, I've made sure that we have delicious steaks in our fridge ready to roast on the patio. Finally, when I arrived home, everything fell into place. I discreetly parked the car behind the house and brought all the things into the kitchen. Let's figure it out. I have an hour to prepare everything, I whispered to myself. Over the next hour, I carefully placed bottles of wine in the freezer to cool, artfully arranged rose petals in the shape of a large heart on the bed, and with the help of pieces of chocolate wrote the sincere words, I love you in the center. To the last detail, I filled the garden tub with warm water and gracefully scattered the remaining rose petals on its surface, creating a mesmerizing sight. Finally, I made sure to put a bottle of wine in an ice bucket on my side of the bed. I carefully placed the postcard next to the reading lamp on her bedside table. By adjusting the brightness of the overhead light, I created a cozy atmosphere before opening a bottle of wine and pouring two glasses. Having put our portable CD player on the dresser, I planned to turn it on as soon as she entered the bedroom. After taking a shower, shaving, and undressing, I prepared for her arrival. At exactly 3.25 a.m., the sound of a car approaching reached my ears. Feeling a surge of anticipation, I closed the bedroom door and sat at the foot of the bed, completely naked holding glasses of wine in my hands, impatiently waiting for her to come upstairs. As I listened, the sounds of stifled laughter and thundering footsteps resembling horse tread grew louder, signaling the imminent appearance in the bedroom doorway. To my horror, it was none other than Lisa and her boss, Rick. The mere mention of them being together sent chills down my spine, have you ever experienced the excruciating duration of 475 seconds? It feels like an eternity, especially when your gaze meets hers. In these fleeting moments, 
time itself seems to sigh with fatigue. Or rather, it breaks into three heartbreaking blows. That's enough time to destroy any semblance of romance and wreak havoc in a marriage. When Lisa hurriedly burst into our bedroom, it took her brain only five seconds to realize that something had irrevocably changed. When the shirt hung loosely on her, unbuttoned and the bra was thrown away, a surge of awareness flashed through her mind. In just two fleeting seconds, her voice box uttered the words, My God! But it took another agonizing minute and 25 seconds to realize the harsh reality. Her world was literally crumbling. This catastrophic event could easily be called a contender for the fastest destruction of a marriage, if not for second place. In desperation, Rick quickly turned around and ran to the front door, disappearing in just 45 seconds. I saw tears streaming down Lisa's face as she collapsed to her knees. Without hesitation, I emptied both glasses on the bed and began to prepare in front of the closet. Throughout the whole process, I listened attentively as Lisa expressed her remorse and confessed her deep affection for me. It took me about five minutes to get dressed and firmly convey to her that she had better leave before my return. Going down the stairs, I got to my car and set off on my way to the nearest place where I could find solace in a drink. That's how I ended up at Tony's, finishing my fourth beer. I was thinking about my next actions, not knowing what to do next. Returning home at 6.30, I entered a quiet house devoid of any activity. Surprisingly, the front door was unlocked, and Lisa's car, oddly enough, was missing. After going downstairs to relieve myself, I headed for our bedroom. When I entered it, I noticed that everything remained unchanged from the moment I left. The garden tub was still filled with running water, and the wine, postcard, and chocolates remained untouched. Lisa's closet stood ajar, as well as several drawers. Sitting on the bed, I tried to collect my thoughts, but my concentration was interrupted by the sudden ringing of my mobile phone. I ignored the call, deciding not to answer because I wasn't in the mood to talk to anyone at the moment. The next morning when I woke up, I reminded myself that I needed to replace the mattress in the guest room. After packing up, I went to work. But on the way to the office, I looked exhausted and exhausted, like a zombie. Suddenly, all three girls burst into my office with excited screams. Noticing my disheveled appearance, they jokingly remarked that it must have been a stormy night. Karen playfully nudged her girlfriends and teased, to which I replied that it was true. The bitch is cheating on me, I exclaimed, Katie making Cheryl wonder about my reaction. Survive and take care of your children, I muttered. Please keep this a secret. I don't want to be joked about in the office, I pleaded. They apologized and offered their support if I needed to speak out. I thanked them and closed the office door. By 9.30 a.m. I had taken care of closing or changing various financial accounts such as bank accounts, credit cards, life insurance policies, and 401k. After that, I contacted my parents and shared with them the news that Lisa and I were facing some difficulties. I kindly asked them to look after our children until the weekend, and although they were saddened, they readily agreed to help. After checking my mobile phone, I found that Lisa had left me 20 messages, which I decided to throw away. In addition, the lawyer recommended to me a competent lawyer who, if possible, offered reasonable fees. I made an appointment for Friday morning. It's amazing how the true state of affairs becomes apparent after two hours spent with a divorce lawyer who outlines your limited options. In this case, it all came down to the fact that your word is against hers. Lisa and Rick didn't take any action when you discovered them and you couldn't just kick her out of the house since it belonged to both of you. What infuriated me the most was the likelihood that she would get custody of the children, the house, and a significant portion of my after-tax income, about 40%. I felt completely betrayed and helpless. He recommended seeking marriage counseling or taking a 90-day break before taking any action. Keith, regardless of your decision, you will most likely have to pay child support for at least the next eight years, as well as pay for the house. The best solution for you is to wait patiently, 
and try to reduce your losses. In my opinion, I would recommend moving into a spare bedroom and creating comfortable conditions for your children, he advised. Following his advice, I left earlier and moved all my belongings to the spare bedroom. I bought a new mattress and threw the old one on the side of the road. Despite the fact that Lisa was not answering her phone, I was looking forward to her possible arrival at the house. In preparation for this, I made sure to pick up the children on Friday after work and treat them to a visit to the pizzeria. They had a great time and were looking forward to returning home. Around 8.30 p.m., Lisa finally showed up. The children immediately rushed to her, but she maintained constant eye contact with me all the time. Gradually, the children went to their rooms, and by 10 o'clock I retired to the guest room. Lisa offered to talk later, but I declined, saying that my current mood was not suitable. I suggested dispassionately that maybe we would talk tomorrow, after which I tightly closed and locked the door. In the distance I heard a frustrated exclamation escape her lips as she examined the remains of what used to be our shared bedroom. I heard the sound of sheets being removed from the bed and other sounds that made me imagine her trying to clean up the room. On Saturday morning my attention was attracted by a discarded postcard, scattered rose petals and chocolates lying in the trash, as well as an empty wine bottle. At that time, the children were enjoying breakfast and doing their usual Saturday chores, spending time with friends and participating in football. Not feeling particularly hungry, I decided to make a cup of coffee. When I was finishing my first cup, Lisa appeared downstairs. I decided to pour myself another cup, took the newspaper, and went out onto the terrace. With red, watery eyes, Lisa declared that eventually we would have to talk. Intrigued, I questioned her, wondering what she could tell me to make sense of what I witnessed on Wednesday. I couldn't help but ask how long she had been having an affair with Rick. Through her sobs, Lisa begged me, assuring me that it had only happened twice. It's hard for me to trust you, and for your information you no longer have the right to address me with such affectionate words as darling or something like that, I exclaimed. We will continue to live together for the sake of our children until I decide what is best for me and for them. It looks like you've already made up your mind. At that moment, she ran into the house, and I tore up the newspaper in anger, finishing my coffee. The next two weeks at work were difficult, but at least not as terrible as my life at home. After a colleague blabbed, I found that I constantly get sympathetic glances from women in my office when I pass by. My boss even asked if I needed a vacation, but I assured him that I was doing great and that I needed the job to keep my sanity. From the very beginning, my children felt that something was wrong, and asked if they were to blame. Don't worry, children, I reassured them. My mother and I are going through a difficult period, but everything will be fine. But deep down, I knew that everything was not so good. Lisa tried to start a conversation with me and even attempted to seduce me at one point. But all the feelings I once had for her have long since disappeared. My mood took a sharp turn for the worse when Cheryl suddenly walked into my office just before closing time on Thursday. Get your coat. We're leaving, she announced. I tried to object, but she interrupted me. You don't seem to understand the situation. This is not just a suggestion. Grab your coat immediately. We're leaving, she repeated. When Cheryl and I got to our destination, we ran into two more members of the impressive trio. Sitting in a secluded corner at Anthony's restaurant, Cheryl turned to me after we ordered drinks. Kit, you really need a distraction, she began. You've been like a lifeless soul for the last two weeks, and even though everyone is supporting you, you're going to get into serious trouble if you don't pull yourself together. I have my reasons, so why don't you just leave me alone? Leave you alone! You're not talking to Lisa, Karen replied. Confused, I asked, What do you want from me? Will you continue to endlessly indulge in self-pity, or do you want to move forward? I expressed my opinion by staring at the glass in front of me. Katie asked, But didn't you mention wanting to rejuvenate your outdated marriage? Do you really want to return to your everyday existence? Do you still love her? A mixture of affection and hostility fills my heart for her. 
I fantasize about standing up to both her and Rick for the pain they caused me, I exclaimed. I'm just lost and I don't know what steps to take or where to start. Let's have a bite to eat and then we'll figure out what's what, Cheryl suggested, gesturing for the waiter to come over. The first step is to equalize the odds. Lisa still lives with you, goes to work every day. And Rick lives happily with his wife and children, despite the fact that it was because of him that your marriage fell apart. Cheryl spat out with determination in her voice. It's time for you to get your life back. As the evening went on, I started to feel better, and they were right. I needed to act. I couldn't let it go on anymore. It was tearing me apart. Upon returning home, Lisa asked where I had been. Why do you care? I shouted as she retreated to her bedroom, tears streaming down her face. The next day I had a meeting with my lawyer Randy. Weren't you planning to wait for the divorce? Yes, but now I want to file a lawsuit against the company Rick and Lisa work for, and also file a lawsuit against Rick for ruining my marriage, I informed him. Keith, you have to understand that without solid evidence, your case may not stand, Randy warned me. I am aware but considering that they work for a company whose shares are listed on the stock exchange, given the recent media coverage of corporate mismanagement, it is unlikely that they will want negative publicity. Moreover, managers are usually expected to work until 5, even when they are on duty. Most corporate bylaws usually contain a moral clause that strictly prohibits a married employee from entering into a romantic relationship with a married employee under their control, especially during working hours. Randy assured me that it would take a couple of days to sort everything out and fill out the necessary paperwork. However, he promised to let me know when the plan was put into action. For the next three days, I maintained my usual whale-like demeanor and shared a carefree mood with my work colleagues. I had a great time with the kids and was glad to meet Lisa again, which brought her some relief. On Thursday, Randy contacted me and informed me that their company had received service, but I asked him to postpone Rick's paperwork until we resolve the issues with their company. The following Tuesday, Randy and I found ourselves in a conference room in front of the CEO and his manager. After reviewing the papers, the manager noted that there were no documents related to the alleged incident. After mentioning the frivolous claims, he expressed surprise when I abruptly stood up and headed for the exit. Well, it looks like we're going to have a meeting in court, I said, getting up from my seat. Keeping a straight face, I added, We will collect the testimony of all the office staff. I wonder how many of them were aware of the situation. I confidently assured them, I just need to find one or two people who are willing to speak out. After thinking about the possible consequences for managers, I asked the question, how many of them do you think will protect Rick when their own interests are at stake? Wishing them good luck, I calmly concluded, gentlemen, Randy and I are leaving. On Wednesday, while I was at my desk, Randy called me. He expressed a desire to settle the current issue, calling it a way to make the situation disappear. I informed Randy that I had requested $250,000, including attorney's fees, and that both parties be transferred to different state offices. I thought this would cover all the necessary aspects. I have instructed Randy to convey that the offer remains valid until Thursday afternoon, after which we will act accordingly. Later in the afternoon, Randy got in touch again. He informed me that they had agreed to commissions and transfers, but were offering $150,000 as compensation. Please stop the negotiations and inform them that the current price is $300,000. In addition, if they submit another counteroffer, the price will increase to $400,000. Perhaps this will put an end to the discussions. On Thursday, at 3.30 p.m., Randy contacted me and informed me that my offer had been accepted. He assured me that the necessary documents would be ready for my signature by 5 o'clock. As promised, a package arrived at my office at 4.30 p.m. The person who delivered it said that he was expected, which was reported by the secretary. After carefully examining the documents and the receipt attached to them, I signed them and handed them back. 
After informing her that I would not be there, I mentioned that I would be out for the rest of the day before leaving the office. On the way home, I dialed Randy's number and quickly gave my instructions for Rick to come to him in the evening. The thought that I would finally receive retribution filled me with great satisfaction. I knew that I would finally be able to leave this chapter of my life behind. Upon entering the house, I addressed everyone present, urging them to bring their coats, since we were going to have dinner that evening. Despite my request, Lisa remained motionless, seemingly untouched by my words. Come on, Lisa, join us, I urged, and a wide smile lit up her face as she eagerly rushed to get her coat. Throughout the dinner, we talked and laughed animatedly, as we have for the last 12 years. It seemed that life had regained its positive essence, although not completely. Upon returning home, all the family members expressed gratitude for the delightful evening, after which they retired to their rooms. When Lisa approached, she kissed me gently on the cheek, expressing her appreciation for the evening. Her words had a deep meaning for me, and I assured her that we would have a meaningful conversation tomorrow evening, advising her to rest a little before that. When Lisa burst through the door, she couldn't help but exclaim angrily, Oh, you vile person! You guessed what was going to happen tonight, didn't you? I answered calmly. Not really, Lisa, but I guessed it. Curious, I asked. So where is that job offer you were talking about? In a frustrated tone, she replied, Apparently, in Tenet, New Jersey, wherever this unknown place is located, they have made it clear that they no longer need my services here, and either New Jersey or I lose my job. Gathering her resolve, she declared, I made it clear to them that I would never be transferred there. Tears were streaming down her face, and she told about the events that had happened. They abruptly handed me severance pay and coldly gave me only 20 minutes to clear the table, she lamented. I devoted eight long years to this company, but in those short moments I was swiftly escorted out the door, she continued, sinking into a kitchen chair and indulging in sadness. Curiosity led me to inquire about the whereabouts of our friend Rick. To my surprise, she replied, He's being transferred to Flint, Michigan. Frozen on the floor, she uttered these words. Known as the armpits of the Northeast, I couldn't resist slyly remarking that this couldn't have happened to a more deserving person, and a malicious grin spread across my face. Lisa, I said in a solemn tone, let me tell you what awaits us at this upcoming stage. What is the reason for such infidelity? During our intimate moments in the last few months, have you been thinking about Rick or about me? How often have you been cheating on me lately? How many extramarital affairs have you had? Are your feelings for me still sincere? I informed Lisa about our meeting tomorrow at 9, adding that if everything goes smoothly, we also have a meeting scheduled with the marriage counselor on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. Lisa was silent, tears streaming down her face as she pondered the questions in front of her. Sensing her willingness, she offered to answer them right now but I preferred to wait until tomorrow, explaining that I no longer trust her, and I want to start everything from scratch without cheating, if she agrees, of course. I was not satisfied with her answer. In my mind, she's already gone. Can I rely on her? Absolutely not. Am I thinking about staying in this relationship? The final decision has not been made yet, but we are actively trying to figure everything out. The most difficult aspect is that we haven't had intimacy in the last five months. And that's what I really crave. We make love once or twice a week, so to speak, to relieve tension. But this does not compare to anything. Rick moved to Flint, Michigan. Last year I sent him a Christmas card from Florida with a message. I'm glad you're not here. By the way, his wife and children have already arrived. It seems that the pleasant southern atmosphere prevailed over the unfaithful husband. Can you believe it? And Lisa and I continue to live in the same house, although we remain married. We sleep in different rooms. Sometimes we have intimate moments, but immediately after engaging in intimacy, I send her to her room. I do not want to sleep in the same bed with my cheating wife. I also started an affair with a beautiful woman and Lisa notices it but doesn't mention it. I know I'm making her suffer but she deserves it. 
And until I realize that I've finally forgiven Lisa, she'll know that I'm sleeping with other women which makes her suffer.